I invite you this morning to turn with me to 1 John chapter 5. Not St. John, but 1 John. You'll need to go back past Hebrews and back past James uh, into the back of your New Testament to 1 John chapter 5. While you're, while you're turning there this morning, I want to ask you a question. Faith. Faith. Think about it. Faith. When you hear the word faith, what comes to your mind? When you begin thinking about faith, what comes into your thinking? What comes to your mind? Let, let's go a little deeper with that this morning. When you think about faith, what response does that prompt? As you begin thinking about faith, what, what, what response does that elicit in you? How does that make you feel? What does it make you think about? Where do your thoughts go? Does it immediately turn your thoughts to the Lord? When you begin thinking about faith, do, do your thoughts immediately shift to the Lord? You begin thinking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Does thinking about faith generate a feeling of hope? As you begin thinking about faith, does that generate in you a feeling of hope, a sense that everything is going to work out? Maybe, maybe thoughts about faith Invoke in you a deep-seated trust, a certainty that God is in control and he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. What does that word, what does that concept, faith, do for you? It is possible, however, that thoughts about faith do the exact opposite for you or for some individuals. It's possible that thoughts about faith produce an uncertainty in your heart, in your mind, and in your life. Do I really have enough faith to bring about God's answer to the needs of my life? You, you see how that can work? It can do the opposite, and we can begin to wonder, do I have the faith that's needed, necessary? I, I have these needs, there's these situations in my life, but do I have enough faith to move the hand of God to meet the needs that are in my life? Your Heavenly Father wants you to know today that faith to believe and receive is openly available to you. Your Heavenly Father wants every one of you as children of God. We kind of settled that a little bit earlier, didn't we? About the fact on whether we were able to take communion or not, what was the requirement? Had we asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins? Have we invited him to be the Lord of our lives? Whenever that takes place, the Holy Spirit comes and transitions us. It's called re regeneration. Takes us literally out of the camp of the enemy. Listen, I, I want to say this over and over again so that all of us understand. And when we're ministering to others, we we have that concept. Every individual who is not living for the Lord is in the enemy's camp and under Satan's authority. But when we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, when we invite him to be the Lord of our life, the Holy Spirit literally takes us out of the enemy's camp and places us in the family of God. You are a child of God even if there's still some polishing that needs to be done in your life, can somebody say, oh, me or amen, whatever, whatever applies this morning. Your heavenly Father wants you to know that faith to believe and receive is openly available to you. I want you to take a look with me this morning. I invited you to turn to First, uh, first John chapter 5 earlier. Now I want you to zero in with me. First John chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. As I always invite you to, please keep your Bibles open. We're going to be referring back to the text. I encourage you to take some notes so that you can refer back to them later. But here we are, First John chapter 5, verse 13. 13, these things, Jesus speaking, these things I have written, I'm not sorry, Jesus speaking, John the apostle speaking, writing, says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may uh, continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You see, when our faith to believe God with our life is strong, when our faith to put our life in God's hands, when our faith to believe God with our life is strong, then our ability to receive what we need to accomplish God's will is secure. When our faith is strong, then our ability to receive is secure. And so I want to share with you this morning three things, three things that enable us to have a faith to believe and receive, things, three things that are necessary in our life to be able to have the kind of faith that enables us to receive. First thing we need to develop an unshakable trust in Jesus. We need to develop an unshakable trust in Jesus. A faith in Jesus that is so strong that it doesn't matter what happens in our life. It doesn't matter what the enemy throws at us. And pastor's not saying that those things don't matter. They don't care. I'm talking about in our relationship to our trust in Jesus. No matter what the world throws at us, no matter what anybody does to us, no matter what anybody says to us, no matter what our body does. How many of you all know our body can betray us at times? No matter what's happening in those situations, we have developed a trust in Jesus that will not be shaken, that will not be turned aside. No matter what's going on, you and Jesus are close personal friends, and that's not going to change. Can somebody say amen? John, with that understanding, says to us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of Jesus, or in the name of the Son of God, that you may, what? Know that you have eternal life. These things I have written to you who are believers, who are children of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, I have to tell you, there's no question Jesus can take care of us. There's absolutely no question that Jesus can take care of us. The question is, do we trust him to? Do we completely trust the Lord to take care of us in whatever situation or circumstance we find ourselves in in life? Now, I have to tell you, we lost out on the opportunity to have a perfect world some 6,000 years ago. When Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, it was a perfect world. Can somebody say amen? Amen. God created it, and we hadn't messed it up yet. But we can't blame Adam and Eve for it all. They got it started. But they've been gone for over 6,000 years, and we've had, we've had dominion over this world ever since, and look what we've done with it. That's a good place to say, oh, me. And so it's not that we can expect the world to all of a sudden be this nice, rosy place that we're going to live in. We're living in a battlefield. We're living in a war zone, and we're going to continue to live in a war zone all the days of our life until we either take our last breath and see Jesus face to face, or we hear the trumpet sound and Jesus calling us home. Can somebody say amen? That's the understanding we need to have. And so the question is not, is Jesus able? The question is, do we trust him to? Not that we trust him to make life all of a sudden so it's a wonderful place, but that we can trust him through all the difficulties and the challenges to do what needs to be done to continue to see us through. See, we find four places or four times in the Gospels where Jesus' ability was certain but the disciples' faith was questionable. Four places mentioned in the Gospels where it's very clear that Jesus' ability, matter of fact, his willingness, his desire, his ability is certain. There's no doubt about it, but the disciples' faith is a little questionable. 
In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is teaching the disciples to trust the Father to provide for their material needs. He's helping them to understand that they can trust the Heavenly Father no matter what they have need of. And so we find in Matthew chapter 6, verse 30, now if God, Jesus teaching, now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? And look what he puts at the end of it. O ye of little faith, of you a little faith. Why is he dealing this with this? Because they don't have faith to believe that God can supply and meet their needs. Then we find in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is crossing the Sea of Galilee with his disciples when a storm arose. Most of you know the story. But here in Matthew chapter 8, verse 26, says, But he, but he said to them, Jesus saying to the disciples, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Again, in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus comes walking across the water in a storm, and Peter decides to get out of the boat. Go, Peter! Right? Come on, go, Peter! He's the only one who had faith to step out of the boat. Yeah, he might have sunk, but at least he stepped out of the boat, right? Go, Peter! But look what happens. Matthew chapter 14, verse 31, and immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Right? Jesus' ability is in not in doubt. Peter was walking on the water. And then we come to that place in Matthew chapter 16, and Jesus is teaching the disciples to beware of false teaching. But all the disciples can think about is the fact that they had forgotten to bring bread on the trip. Jesus is teaching them, you know, be careful of the teachings that are out there, the leaven of the Pharisees, because he was using the comparison of how leaven gets into bread and causes it to puff up and rise up, and how false teaching can get into hearts and minds and cause pride and false understandings and, and, and not being able to truly re relate to what God wants them to know and follow in their lives. But all the disciples can think about is, oh, he's upset because we forgot to bring bread. Then Jesus reminds them, he says, hey guys, you were there when I fed the 5,000. You were there when I fed the 7,000. Don't you think I can take care of lunch today? Oh, you of little faith. See, over and over, Jesus proved he is willing and able to protect and provide for us. We only need to place our trust in him. Over and over again, it's proven Jesus is not only able, but willing. We just need to put our faith and trust in him. He will provide our clothing. Can somebody say amen? He will provide the roof over our head. He will provide the vehicle we need to drive. He will work in our relationships. He will work in our homes and in our families. Amen. He'll provide the job that we have need of. He'll provide the health that we have need of in our lives. We need to trust him. That's where our faith needs to be, that unshakable trust in Jesus. But here's a few things. We need to develop an unshakable trust in Jesus' love for us. We need to develop an unshakable trust that no matter what anybody says, no matter what anything that happens in our life, even the own doubts in our mind. How many of you all know that the greatest battlefield we have is in our own mind? We need to develop an unshakable trust in Jesus' love for us. Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Let me ask, what does Jesus have to do to convince you that he loves you? Right? What does he have to do to convince you that he loves you? He already went to the cross of Calvary. Can somebody say amen this morning? He already laid down his life. He already came down and lived as you and I lived so we can see that it's possible. You know, whenever I was growing up, I loved those examples from people, real mentors in my life. Whenever I was learning things for the first time, when I was trying to figure out how to do life, how to live life, trying to figure out how, how do you accomplish some of the things that need to be accomplished. And there was individuals that were living it out in front of me. 
They were showing me by their example how this is done, how you live it out, how you work it out. Jesus came and lived it out in front of us so that we could look at his example of his great love for us. He didn't just give us the Bible and say, you guys figure it out. Have you ever put anything together from Ikea? You get the box, you get the instructions, and then you figure it out. But that's not what Jesus did. God gave us the fullness of the scope of the Word of God, and then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Jesus demonstrating His love over and over again. And one of the, one of the ways to develop a greater trust in Jesus' love is to love Him back unconditionally. To determine in our hearts and minds, no matter what happens, I'm going to love you, Jesus. No matter what anybody says, anybody does, I'm not getting off of that. That's one note I'm going to keep pounding all the days of my life. Jesus, I love you. Heavenly Father, I love you. Holy Spirit, I love you. And there's nothing anybody can do to change that. Can somebody say man? You see, whenever you start loving Jesus unconditionally, then it helps you to understand just a little bit how much he loves you unconditionally. Can somebody say amen? See, we need to also develop an unshakable trust in Jesus' desire and ability to bring us into eternity with him. Jesus has an unshakable desire and the ability to see you through all the way to eternity. Amen? And we need to develop a trust in that. Pastor, what has that got to do with the price of eggs in China? Well, let me tell you. When you're going through a hard spot in your life, and how many of y'all, come on, let's just, let's just be real here. How many of you have not only been through hard spots, you've been through almost unimaginably hard spots in your life? When you're going through something like that, you need to know there's something on the other side. Come on. Right? When you're in the darkest night of your life, you need to know that morning is coming. You need to know that hope is coming. Amen? Now, we have hope in this life. Come on, amen? We have hope in this life. Jesus is not going to leave us hanging. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. But I want to tell you, no matter how bad it gets and no matter how good it gets, none of those things apply or compare to what we're going to receive. Can somebody say amen? So when we're in those places, we need to have that unshakable trust that Jesus has the desire and ability to see us through everything in this life and and into eternity with him. When challenges come, you will know that Jesus is at work to see you through all the way to eternity. Now, number two, you will need to make honoring the Lord your top priority. See, we have to take our calendar and our checkbook and reorganize our life to make Jesus the top priority in our life. Say, Pastor, why the calendar and the checkbook? Well, you know, from our estimation, the two greatest resources we have is our money and our time. So all we have to do is take a few moments and look in our calendar and look at our checkbook, and we'll soon figure out who's got the highest priority in our life. Now, don't anybody raise their hand to this, but just let me throw this little example out here. How many of you all, if you looked at your calendar and your checkbook, your grandchildren would have the highest priority in your life? Some of us, if we looked at our calendar and our checkbook, it's our hobbies that have the greatest priority in our lives. I'm not saying that this morning to condemn anybody. I'm just talking about the reality. We need to make honoring the Lord the top priority in our life. Not that those other things don't have, they have a place of priority, don't they? They have a place of importance in our life, but we have to be careful that they don't take the top spot in our lives. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 14 with me. 
Now, this is the confidence. Say that word with me this morning, confidence. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him, in God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We have a confidence that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. You know, as a child of God, we have placed our life in God's hands. Amen? I remember as a young child, I'd placed my life in God's hands. And then whenever I got up into my teenage and my young adults, my late teens and young adult uh, uh, years, I, I, I took it back out of His hands. I'm just being truthful with you. Oh, I still believed in God. I still acknowledged God. But he was no longer the pilot of my life. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even the co-pilot. I might have given opportunity to be a good stewardess once in a while. Oh, how dumb I was. But there came that point in time whenever the realization of God's love for me, the desperation of my life came together. And in that moment, I rededicated my heart, my life, my soul, my being to Jesus Christ all over again. And ever since then, I have led a perfect Christian life. Sanctification is progressive. Can anybody say amen? But we got to keep progressing. Can anybody say amen? Praise God. And, and so when we see that, as a child of God, we've placed our life in God's hands. Let us trust him. We've placed our life in God's hands. Let us trust him that he knows the best way for us to live that life. Can I get an amen this morning? Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same, amen, whatever you do, whatever you speak, whatever you say, whatever your attitude is, come on, whatever your hands find to do, wherever your feet compel you to walk, everything, everything that we do, do it to honor God. I love to eat. Come on, anybody in the house brave enough to admit that you enjoy food? You, you, don't just, you don't just eat because you got to live. You, 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 you kind of enjoy good food. Anybody can enjoy good food? Well, you know, I believe the Lord blessed me, Sarah, with that good food. Fran, thank you, sweetheart, for the good meals that you prepare. Fran was our chef at, at Summit. She did such a wonderful job feeding us at Summit. Amen. But I make sure no matter where I'm at before I eat, I thank Jesus for the food I'm about to eat. Now, I'm not just being silly this morning. I'm just talking about the fact that I trust him, right, with every aspect of my life. I want to honor him in every aspect of my life. If I go fishing, how many of you all know fishing can be a sanctified endeavor? I mean, all of the apostles were fishermen, right? Well, not really, but hey, it fits the story. See, we don't want to get this mindset that what we do in church and for church is our Christian life, and we give that over to the Lord. But when I'm on the job, that's just, that's just secular. That's just what I've got to do to make a living. No, everything in our life is sacred. Let me say that again. Everything in your life is sacred. Everything in your life, you belong to God 100%, and everything in your life should honor God. Do it as under the Lord. You know, I love to hear... When people that are associated with our church and I'm talking to their employers and I'm talking to their bosses and I hear back, Gwen is such a remarkable lady. When she was working for Pine Grove Elementary School, she is such a blessing to us. 
Mary is such a remarkable teacher. She's doing such a great job. Her class has the highest standards in that particular, I think, mathematics, whatever it might have been there, you know? I love hearing that. Not only am I proud for them, but I'm proud for the kingdom of God. Because they're understanding and we're understanding that we're representing Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit in us is going to empower us and enable us to excel in any area of our life that we've turned over to Jesus. And when we excel, the Scripture says that we are, we are the light of the world. And that we should let our light so shine that men should see our good works and do what? Give us a pat on the back? No, glorify our Father in heaven. Can somebody say amen this morning? See, we know that as one of God's children, God listens to all of our prayers. Did you know that? As a child of God, God listens to every single prayer you've ever prayed, even that sarcastic one you pray. <laughs> but when God hears our request, it means he's ready to take action. Now, you notice I'm making a distinction between God listening to our prayers and God hearing our prayers. You say, Pastor, what's the difference? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because he listens to every prayer that we pray. But there's only certain prayers that he hears with an intention to take action. Let me give you an illustration. The Supreme Court of the United States of America, they listen to all kind of cases. Throughout the course of the year, there'll be many lawyers, many agencies that'll bring cases before the Supreme Court. But how many of you all know how this works? It's not until they determine they're going to hear a case that they're going to take action on that. So they listen to a lot of cases, but there's only certain ones they're going to, they're going to take action on. They're going to declare or render a judgment or a verdict on. John said that we can be confident that when we honor God's will with our request, he's ready to respond. We can be confident that when we honor God's will with our request, when we're praying according to God's will, that God is hearing that prayer request with an intention to take action on that need. Here's the third thing we need to know. Know that God will supply whatever you need to accomplish his purpose for your life. Know that God will supply whatever, absolutely whatever you need to accomplish his purpose for your life. 1 John chapter 5, verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, now I want you to pay attention. There's some key words in this passage of Scripture. There's the word if. And then we find the word no twice in this text. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked, uh, we have asked, uh, uh, asked of him, right? Uh, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Now look at that passage of Scripture there. It says what? If we know. Now, remember at the beginning of this message, I talked about the fact that those four places in the Gospels where Jesus' ability was certain, but the disciples' faith was questionable. Here we're back to that same concept. The if relates to us. The if relates to our faith. It doesn't relate to God in any way. It relates to us. If we know that he hears us, that's our faith. Do you believe that God is listening to that request? No. Do you believe that God is hearing that request with an intention to act on it? And if you know that he hears you, if you know that what you're praying is according to the will of God, if you know and trust God's love for you, if you know and trust his ability and desire to see you into eternity, come on, if you're making Jesus the top priority in your life, then when you get to this time of prayer, then you know that you know that you know that Jesus hears what you're saying. Can somebody say amen? amen. And then whatever you ask... Whatever you ask, we know there's a second no. We know that we, that we have the petition that we've asked, uh, we've asked of him. See, we have a certainty that God is not only listening, 
but ready to answer any prayer of faith that honors his will for our life. He's ready to answer any prayer of faith that responds, that's in accordance, that honors his will for our lives. And folks, it's not really that complicated. The devil wants us to get all hung up on how do I know this is God's will for my life, right? How do I know? How can I pray and know that this is God's will for my life? Well, first of all, he's given us his word. Every question we have to life, we can find the answer in God's word. God gives us direction. He gives us guidance. He gives us parameters. He lines things out for us. We need to be students of the word of God. We need the Holy Spirit speaking to us from God's word so that we can understand what is according to God's will and what's not according to God's will. And here's an, another added bonus that we have. Your God is a big enough God that if you want to know his will, he's able to direct you in his will even when you don't realize he's doing it. Hallelujah. He is guiding you and directing you every single day of your life. And he's given you the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you to speak words of life to you, to give you wisdom and understanding and discernment, and to help you know what God's will is for your life. Now, I know that's not real. There's not really a demon on one side of our shoulder and an angel on the other side of our shoulder that's pulling us back before, you know, do this, don't do that, oh, do the good thing, do the bad thing. But there is the Spirit of God living inside of us. And He's speaking to us. And He's speaking to us. And He's speaking to us. And this is why humility is such an important quality for a son or daughter of God. Because if we have too much pride, when the Holy Spirit speaks to us, our human pride allows our sinful nature to rise up. And even though the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, even though the Word of God is speaking to us, we choose to go the wrong way instead of the right way. And our Heavenly Father is so patient. Is that right, June? Our Heavenly Father is so patient that He tries to direct us and pull us back and head us in the direction where we can answer his will. But you know what happens when people are over on this side, when believers are over on this side? They get frustrated. They get upset. They get discouraged. Why, oh, why, God, are you allowing this to happen to me? I thought you loved me. Jesus is saying, I want to bless you, but I can't bless you on this side. we got to get you back to that side. Because if you stay on this side, you're going to keep going down the wrong road. And the Scripture tells us that every man did what he thought was right in his own eyes. And it led to destruction. We need to trust that the God who created us and the God who just died to save us and the God who resurrected to give us life and the God who sits at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for us, and the God that sent the Holy Spirit back to be with us every single day of our life because Jesus promised, I will never leave you or forsake you, is the same God that will guide us according to his will. See, Jesus promised to stand with us and provide for us in this life of faith. John chapter 14. And I'd like to invite our musicians to come back to the platform. But John chapter 14, and I'd encourage you to write this down. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 12. Most assuredly, Jesus says. Now think of that opening statement. Most assuredly, with absolute truth and confidence, I say to you. 
There should be no doubt in your mind what I'm about to tell you, Jesus is saying. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Faith to believe and to receive. Amen? Faith to believe and to receive. You know, we're standing at an important place in our lives. It's the day before tomorrow. You see, what we decide today is going to determine our tomorrow. And the tomorrow after that, and the tomorrow after that, and the tomorrow after that. You see, we can choose to live the way we've been living up to this point, or we can step into a new reality. We can step into a new place in our relationship with God. We can let go of all the things in our previous life that's been holding us back, and we can step into a new reality in Jesus Christ to completely trust his love for us, to make him the top priority in our life, to know that we know that we know that God will supply whatever we have need of to accomplish his purpose for our lives and determine in ourselves, I'm going all the way with Jesus, amen? My life is no longer my own. My life belongs to you because, Lord, I know my life will be read better, richer, fuller, and produce more fruit if I do it your way. Can somebody say amen? And so I want to close with them message I gave you at the beginning of this, when our faith to believe God with our life is strong, when our faith to believe God with our life is strong, then our ability to receive what we need to accomplish God's will is secure. I want to be in that place. You see, there's so much. I'm going to be truthful with you. There's so much I need to believe the Lord for. There's absolutely so much I need to believe the Lord for. How about you? There's so much that's really out of my control. You know, I'm an organizer. I don't like it when things are out of my control. But tough. They already are. Have you figured that out? How many of y'all have figured out that life really is out of your control? Well, some of y'all figure that out at some point. When you do, you can come right back to Jesus. Because he is the one that has control. Amen? Now, I don't mean that our life is totally out of control. I just simply mean that we have to trust the one who holds our life in his hand. Trust him that he knows the best way, that he's going to show us what that best way is, and that he's going to provide for everything along the journey to get us to that place where we're producing much fruit that brings honor to the Heavenly Father. Now, I'm so glad that already this month I preached the message on testing. If you didn't hear the message on testing, please go back online and listen to it because you need to understand that testing has a purpose in your life. But the testing is only momentary. The glory and grace and provision and love of God lasts for an eternity. Can somebody say amen? You know, our musicians are here, and they're going to begin to play and minister to us through the great gift that God has given them. But what I want us to do is to allow the Holy Spirit begin searching our hearts and helping us this morning. If there's anything in our heart and mind that's holding us back from the fullness that God has for us, from that direction that he wants to guide us, from being able to love Jesus unconditionally and completely and trust him with our lives, keeping us from allowing God to take the place of priority in our lives, keeping us from believing that he can and will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Let's just take a few moments this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to do that work of grace in our lives that will lift us into a place where we can bring glory and honor to God every moment of every day of our life. Can somebody say amen this morning?